I am excited today to have Josh Knox on the podcast. Josh is a pioneering entrepreneur who recognized the pain points of agency owners and turned it into an innovative business idea. He founded Numeric, a product that serves the need of the agency owner by reducing payment processing costs by 50% with its dual pricing technology. In the fast-paced world of agency ownership, reducing costs while maintaining high-quality services, that's a game changer. And today, Numeric is helping agency owners manage their costs better. Josh, I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for being on the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Well, I appreciate it. Welcome to Catalytic Leadership, the podcast designed to help leaders intentionally grow and thrive. Here is your host, author and leadership and executive coach, Dr. William Attaway. Josh, I'd love to start with you sharing a little bit of your story with our listeners, particularly around your journey and your development as a leader. How did you get started? Um, it's a great question. Um, honestly, I just saw a problem and started trying to fix it as best as I could. And then um, through that process, you know, obviously learned a tremendous amount of information, a lot of experience, a lot of research. And just use that to, I guess, guide people. Most people that get on a conversation with me, um, and, I, and, and to be fair, I don't know that I would consider myself a leader, right? In the sense that, you know, I, I know all things and see all things. I, I would consider, consider myself a leader, I suppose, simply because I provide people with information and options so that they can make good choices, right? Uh, with with regard to my particular field of interest. So I just got going by watching what was going on. In this case, in the high-level uh, Facebook group, um, I was doing some marketing for a payments company um, as, as like a contract CMO for them and just noticed that all their marketing was disparate. It was WordPress and ClickFunnels and what happens to a lot of entrepreneurs, right? We kind of get caught by that shiny object. And so they had a lot of their marketing out there in, in different places. And, um, as I was going through the process of consolidating that, sort of one high level kind of came online. That was 2018, 2019. Um, and so just started getting involved with the community as a marketing person with a marketing background and saw that hole, that gap in the marketplace. And just started answering people's questions. Quite honestly, that's how it, that was the genesis of it, really. So about Numeric, you know, I've been hearing about Numeric for a while and have recently jumped in the water myself with my business. What makes Numeric different? Why did you start it and say, hey, this, this can change the game? Um, first of all, thanks for coming on board. Um, yeah. <laughs> glad to have you. It's been um, a great experience. And I'll just say that from, from a, a customer perspective. Good. I'm glad. Yeah. What makes this different? I listen, we're not, if it sounds harsh to say this, cause I'm not, I just don't hate on people or products. Some products work better for other people. Right. Um, but with Stripe, they're huge. They're sort of faceless, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. and I don't think that's, any fault of their own, big corporations, it just happens that way. I mean, I think the last time I looked at them, they were bringing on something like 20,000 new clients a month or something. That's staggering. I mean, that's like, how do you put a face to that, right? How do you, how do you support that? So I think first and foremost, you can get me on the phone. You can talk to me. Um, and to be fair, uh, hopefully without sounding too much like a brown noser, high level provides a pretty good model for that, right? Mm -hmm. Sean, Robin, and Alex get on the phone with folks. Yeah. And so using their system and watching what they're doing, it seemed pretty obvious to me, hey, why don't you just get on the phone and talk to somebody um, mm -hmm. and see if you can't help them through whatever they're dealing with. In this case, their cash flow being cut off completely, right? Because Stripe canceled them. So yeah. I think that's one of the big differentiators. The second thing is... is um, just how we do what we do, right? So there's a stability in how we set up a merchant, uh, what we call merchants, right? There's a stability to that. On Stripe, PayPal, Square, they have terms of service. 
all banks do. Stripe's a payment software first and foremost. Okay, they're not a bank. I'm not a bank. PayPal's not a bank. But they are connected to spot what are called sponsor banks, and those sponsor banks have uh, risk profiles. Stripe's taken it a bit further. Same with PayPal, Square, because they're also a payment facilitator, which means they're in the middle of that risk profile, and so. What we do, how we're different is we remove ourselves as being in the middle of that risk profile and we connect the merchant straight to the bank and then let the bank um, have access to that merchant and assess their risk and therefore give them approval. It makes this infinitely more stable to provide support for somebody. I tell, I tell most folks uh, who have a call with me in the agency space, you either have to commit fraud like mm -hmm. knowingly or unknowingly. And the way I say unknowingly is like, let's say you're, let's say you grow too fast. You get too close to the sun, you get burnt, right? It's happened. Mm -hmm. um, and you get all these kind of chargebacks and you run into a real problem. So you either have to do that or knowingly commit fraud, sell stuff and don't ship it, right? Yeah. Um, the other way is, is you don't actually have a product, therefore you don't make sales, therefore you don't pay your bill. Like that's really the way that I've seen people lose accounts. It's not this, Hey, you violated our terms of service. Uh, thanks, but no thanks, right? So that's another way to differentiate. And the third is pricing, right? So our technology lets people do dual pricing, which cuts costs 50 to 90% over Stripe, PayPal, Square, Authorize.net. You pick it, and we can typically beat that traditional cost 50 to 90%. Hmm. Um, and so those three things, right? You're a human, so you should be able to talk to another human. Um, you, you have challenges that you're working through like people do, then provide stability, then provide outstanding product, right? So I think that's really what separates us uh, in our market space. Yeah, I'm seeing more and more people in the high level group and beyond in agency world who are, you know, they're going along, everything's going fine. And then one day they wake up. And their Stripe accounts closed. Yep. And they may get that money at some point that's in their Stripe account. But the stories that I've heard is if they get it, it takes months. And this can be tens of thousands of dollars. Yes. That's right. just sitting there. And it, it may take six months. Yep. A lot of businesses are not in a position where they can handle that kind of a loss with no warning and with no immediate solution for them to to take payments from clients. Correct. And and I think, you know, when I first learned about Numeric, I was like, okay, here's somebody who's on the solution side of this problem. Are, are you seeing this more and more with Stripe and with other processors that it's just no warning, no anything, just boom, it's turned off? Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a trend. It, it's for sure a trend. Um, you know, the, the bigger people tend to get, so uh, again, high level, not saying anything bad about it, but the bigger they get and the more people that use them, then the statistics work and work against you, yeah. so to speak, on having your account closed. I mean, their terms of service are pretty clear on what they're after. Everybody now who's paying a ton of attention to it are, are pretty aware that Stripe's changed their business strategy, their model. They're looking for more low risk. Um, and when I say risk, right, I'm talking about do you sell a product online digitally that you then di digitally deliver that becomes a little bit more difficult to verify delivery on? Even if you've got audit logs and Zoom recorded mm -hmm. phone call, all this kind of stuff, it's still a higher risk because the person that paid you wasn't in front of you. You never saw the card, right? right. There's all these things that have just been part of the car um, card payment industry for years and years and years. And so... As Stripe started shifting their business model, um, then it became apparent that those who were selling digital products, coaching, you pick it, right? In terms of a card not present when somebody bought something from you, Stripe's like, eh, it's just not really where we want to be with things. They grew to such a level that they could sort of shift their model. And it happens in business. Like mm -hmm. I think it was Honda that first came out with a rice maker and now they make cars and planes. So obviously <laughs> business is shifting. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's 
I hear it pretty frequently. So it's, I, I have usually the same phone calls every week. Hey, Stripe cut me off. What do I do? Or I'm worried about Stripe cutting me off. What do I do? Mm -hmm. Um, it's, and then the third one is, is, Hey, I'm tired of paying the fees. What do I do? Right. <laughs> yeah, so, right. But, but getting back to what you said in the beginning, if somebody gets cut off from their cash flow, cause that's what's happening. Right. Mm -hmm. I tell people this all the time you can have, so there's really three legs to your chair in business. There is a product. Then you've mm -hmm. got to sell that product. Then you got to get paid for that. product. The mm -hmm. first two can be the most amazing things on the planet. You could have cured cancer, right? Mm -hmm. And then everybody knows I need to buy that product who has cancer. I hate to use that as an analogy. I'm just going to use it. If you can't take payment for that product, then you don't have a business, right? That's right. And so it becomes a huge challenge for folks. Now, most businesses, I, I was trying to pull up the statistics because I just wrote this down again the other day. It's something like 70 plus percent of businesses in the U.S. don't have more than 21 days worth of cash. Mm. That's a huge problem, right? Yeah. And so if you think about um, what that means, Stripe will typically cut somebody off and say, you've got two weeks until you're going to stop taking payment. But what's the likelihood, even in that two weeks, that they're going to let you keep that money if they've deemed you too high of a risk to keep? It's not yep. super high, right? Because then they put themselves at risk. And that's not really what they're in business to do. So um, it just is a... It's a huge challenge for a business owner as to what to do when that happens. And mm -hmm. that's where we come in. And you have a process that really makes transition smooth. I mean, again, as somebody who's just gone through this, transitioning from Stripe to Numeric was not terribly complicated and it didn't take months. Can you talk about that process? Yeah, I mean, thank you. We're trying to make it better and better every day. But basically, in, in payments, right, nobody really owns that card data. I don't own it. Hmm. Um, Stripe doesn't own it. PayPal doesn't own it. No sponsor bank or gateway owns it. The customer owns it. Um, and so Stripe has a way um, that we can have the merchant, so that's you, right, request your what we call your Stripe data. And Stripe will export that, we can import it, and then you can use it again. That means you don't have to collect cards. Um, you don't have to collect them again. So basically, mm -hmm. if you come to me, which you did, and you say, hey, I wanna move to New America, I go, great, let's import your Stripe data. Here's the three steps that you need to take to get it out of Stripe. We then say, thanks for that data, and we import it. What comes in is John Smith with his Visa card, right? We don't get John Smith with his Visa card uh, for product A that's billed on the 15th of every month, we get John Smith. So in a couple of clicks, you can have John Smith up and running again in our system without having to bother John Smith about giving his card again, right? I've got somebody right now that's transitioning over to us for, I think, 900 subscriptions. Mm. And it's going to take them, they'll have it done in a day. Like the, all 900 subscriptions will be done in a day. So wow. it's not difficult. It's not difficult. Is this just for agency owners? Oh, no. No, we, you know, our, our concept from the beginning was to solve for the agency first. Mm -hmm. They're under the most pressure um, because mm -hmm. of, of what we just talked about, which is the digital stuff. Um, but we also built it so they could offer it to their clients, right? So to think about, so obviously we've learned from high level very brilliantly that churn rate in an agency is super high before you add a SaaS product, right? Um, right. And it, I think I think I've heard those guys like Chase talk about it. It can be as high as like eighty percent, sixty to eighty percent, mm -hmm. or something like that. When you add a SaaS, it goes down dramatically. It goes into the single digits. Now I don't remember the exact single digit, but it goes dramatically down. So now the agency is armed with this really powerful tool to retain clients that they would like to keep servicing add payments to that. It's like bundling home and auto, right? Like that's my best example. You bundle yeah. your home and auto and you say, right? Right. And so when you add payments to that mix, so now they've got a SaaS product that's driving leads, increasing business. Now add payments to that for your clients and you've driven the churn rate even lower into the low, low single digits. I'm going to say it's a low, below 5% is the churn rate. 
But add to that that what we do with dual pricing, nearly every time you're going to save as an agency your client enough money that your services now technically become free. So let me explain. If I save you, let's say you charge five, six, seven hundred dollars a month for your SaaS product, right? So you're an agency and you service HVAC, whatever it is. Um, and you charge six, seven hundred dollars a month for that. If that HVAC company, and I know lots of them where I'm at locally that are doing fifteen million dollars a year, okay? Hmm. If you're only charging, let's say you're charging $1,500 a month to that HVAC company that's doing that kind of volume. I will save that HVAC company enough money every month by switching to my service inside of the SaaS they're already providing. Then it's going to pay that $1,500 and in a lot of cases more. Hmm. So now you as an agency have a great product you're providing and a great service with payments and they're saving enough money. Why would they ever leave you? They shouldn't ever like, I, I know people leave for various reasons, but if you just look at the dollars and cents of it and you're doing a good job as an agency, there should be no reason they would ever leave you ever. So I think that's brilliant. <laughs> I think that's, it's such a way to add value to the clients that you serve. Right. Yeah. In addition to improving your own bottom line, it's a win-win. It's a win-win. Yeah. So that bottom line, that's the extra piece that I didn't say. So I'm glad you brought it up. So as a business owner, you make revenue, right? You generate revenue when you make a sale. So the more, in terms of agencies, the more SaaS products or the more services I sell, the more revenue I generate, right? Mm -hmm. When you add numeric and we pay you a residual affiliate income, you are now, you're already before I even became involved, driven to be, driven to help your client be more successful because then they stay with you, right? Yeah. And then you can get more people. You got case studies and all these things that you can do to show why your business should be the right one to trust. Now we're giving you the ability to make income on every one of your client's sales as well. So you're not just making revenue on your sales, you're making revenue on everybody that's using your SaaS product and going through them. Like, so what's the downside? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, the downside is, is it's a new tool and you got to learn how to use it, but we do our best yeah. to make it super easy to use and, and we'll take care of everybody. Right. So if anybody that wants, you know, anybody that does become an affiliate, um, you obviously get an affiliate link. They come through that. We take care of them the same way we take care of you. So they come through the door. We help them get uh, the merchant account. We help them get onboarded and connected. We'll even work directly with you and your team if we need if you need our help uh, supporting the client. But we're more than happy to support all of that and just send you a check every month. I got to tell you, I mean, so far, in my experience and the experience of the people that I work with has been incredibly positive. So let me ask you this. I know you're not just settling for what is. <laughs> What's next for Numeric? Um, in all honesty, I would love to displace Stripe in high level completely. Mm. Now, it sounds big, sounds hairy, it sounds audacious, right? Yeah. It's a hack. So yeah, um, yeah. But if you think of it this way, I do believe we're uniquely suited to support agencies better than Stripe can long term. And that's yeah. okay. Like I said, Stripes, I'm not a Stripe hater in any way, shape, or form. I just tend to look at it straight from the numbers and what agencies can do. So there's a couple right. of things I think about. First and foremost, if you think about all the volume, just the payment volume that's going through high level, and you compare, and it's, a, it's obviously mostly on Stripe, right? 99.9% .9 of it. I think it's in there anywhere in the neighborhood of one to two billion dollars. I could be a little bit off on that, but if you think about, let's just say, let's go big and say it's ten billion dollars. I don't remember the number. Stripe last year did a trillion dollars in sales uh, in volume. What's the percentage of that ten billion to a trillion? It's yeah. not big, right? So I say that because 
Um, not because again, I'm trying to take business from Stripe. It's simply because I think we can do a better job. In fact, I know we can do a better job. Is there a lot of work in front of us to do that? For sure. There's no doubt about that. However, removing that risk for agency owners so that they don't have to worry about getting their cash flow cut off, waking up one day and having nothing, right? And then scrambling to get their legs back underneath them while still running the business. Mm-hmm. I've just seen the stress on people's face and it sucks. Just yeah. going to cut straight to the chase. Like new business owners, older business owners, right? People that have been, been in business for decades. The stress is enormous for those folks when their cash flow is cut off. So removing that risk for them is huge for me. Um, and, and being able to provide that stability to them is really what it comes down to. So, yeah, that's the that. big hairy goal. I love it, man. <laughs> let me, let me ask you, Josh, I mean, you, you and your team, your company needs you to lead at a higher level today than it did even just a few years ago. And five years from now, as you move toward that BHAG, yeah, it's going to need you to lead at a higher level yet. What do you do to stay on top of your game? How do you level up with the new leadership skills that your team and your clients are going to need you to have? Uh, I, I stay close to God. That's my, mm-hmm. that's my short answer in all, in all honesty. Um, every day I stay as close to him as possible and look for the inspiration to do the right thing. Some days I receive the message loud and clear. And I mean, I would say it's getting better and better. The, the closer I yeah. stay to him, the, the more direct the line of communication becomes, I've found. Yeah. Which then allows me to be calmer, um, more thoughtful, um, less reactionary, less emotional about things. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. I mean, some days I totally sure. fumble it, right? Um, but that's the honest answer. Um, and so love that. when that question comes to me, look, everything I do has is centered around having, uh, God in my life and, and being spiritually connected because it, it, it leads me to read the right books. So mm. if a new leadership book comes out, then I'm more aware of that. It leads me to talk to the right people. Um, and then have the right conversations with those folks. It leads me to be more thoughtful in nearly everything that I do. Um, so mm. whether it's in business or in personal life, that's the answer. But, and that's the most straight answer I can give. No, I think that's brilliant. I mean, as a person of faith, I resonate very deeply with that. And I believe that a lot of our listeners will as well. I, I hope that. so. I, I we yeah. live in a really interesting world uh, yeah. these days, uh, and it's a, I do think it's a global challenge. We've, I think, to some degree, without stepping on toes or hopefully not being offensive in any way, we've lost our way a bit with who we're connected to, and I think we let yeah. whatever part of our life uh, we let a lot of rhetoric get into it, and we need to be kinder and yes. and we need to be peacemakers and more temperate and how we treat one another, quite honestly, well, whether we agree or disagree. So, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to have days where I disagree with my team um, and they're going to disagree with me. And I'm going to have days where I think, you know, I absolutely did the right thing. And I'm like, Ugh, I messed that one up. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's how I do it. That's how Love I do it. it. It's the only way to you, do it. You, in my you, opinion. I'm with you. <laughs> you. You mentioned that that you know you're a reader, and you know new books, leadership books, things that have that have helped you to grow and develop. Is there one that stands out that you know out of all the places that you've that you've read, all the books you've read, one that you would recommend to the leaders who are listening? Hey, if you haven't read this, this was a game changer for me. Yeah, um, I mean it's it's going to sound. Cr- I'm going to say two books. It's going to sound cliche now that I've said the spirituality side, obviously the scriptures that yeah. you're not going to find a greater book on leadership than the scriptures. Now, second True. to that in the day to day life that we're living, what are the books? I've just, um, I've just completed, actually I'm reading it again for, I think the third time, um, buy back your time 
by Dan oh, Martell. Dan Martell, yeah. So I didn't know anything about this person. This book came out, I think, last year, 2023. Never heard of the SAS Academy before. Never. I never even really thought of myself as a SAS person, but the reality is, is numeric, our software, is mm -hmm. a SAS. You can yeah. white label it, you can resell it, you can generate revenue from it. It's a SaaS. It's different than the GHL SaaS, but I tell a lot of people I'm sort of the GHL payments, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so this book has really resonated with me on um, a huge level. Now I've read lots of books. I've got another book on my desk, 10X is easier than 2X, mm -hmm. um, which was a huge thing for me. But then this this book, Buy Back Your Time, is really big because he's so simple as to what he's saying, right? I, I've always loved the acronym KISS. Keep it simple, stupid, right? Yes. And yes. so when he tells you what, everything that you should be doing should be to buy back more of your time, like, well, yeah, that makes perfect sense. So, yeah, I mean, and then to understand where it comes from and how it was developed, that kind of stuff I get into. But really, like, don't overthink it. You know, read the book. He says, the first thing he says is get yourself an assistant if you don't have an assistant. So I was literally doing everything, even though I've got a team, I was answering all the emails. And uh, while I wasn't debugging any bug that came in, I was still talking to the development team for all the bugs and, you know, doing the marketing and responding to everybody on Facebook and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and so he's like, just get an assistant, like figure that piece out and get an assistant. So I did. And it's huge. Um, it's hard to let go. I think that's one of those things that leaders um, could do better at. And I think that's really what he's saying in the book is you need to learn to let go of things because it's hard. When you, when me, when I'm looking at a communication from a client or um, a lead, I, my instantaneous reaction is to treat that person like a human, like I'm in a conversation. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't ask a question of you and then wait two days for you to get back to me, right? I wouldn't say, yeah. hey, William, I've got a question for you about X, Y, Z, and then go, and then just stare at your face for two days, right? right? So my instant reaction for folks is how quickly can I resolve your question, right? Mm -hmm. It's a question, it's a challenge, it's an inquiry, whatever it is, how quickly can I help you? And when you hire somebody to do that for you, you have to let go of, you give them some guide rails. Here, I'd like to respond in these time frames and in this manner, but you also have to let them be them. Why you hired them, be them, let them be unique in their skills and abilities inside of those guide rails. And that's been one of the biggest challenges as a leader um, of a business to do. It's hard, but it's really, really rewarding too when they get it. So, it's like watching your kids grow up. Hundred percent, in my opinion. I, you know, I think I, of all the problems that I work with my clients on, you've keyed in. That's probably one of the top five. This, this, I call it being at the center of the spider web. And business owners, founders, are particularly prone to this because when you started, you had to do everything. Yeah, you know, you you had to wear every hat, but as you grow and scale and find success, you hire other people to help you with fulfillment, and yet there's still that reluctance to let go. Yeah, because there's there's well, wait a minute, I, I know how to do that. I can I can handle that. I can handle. It. And unless you learn how to stop doing that, you will become the lid on the organization's growth, on your team's growth, and you will dramatically impact your team's retention over time. Yeah, it's yeah. You you know this better than me because you coach really really successful people, and I think I'm successful, but I don't think I'm to the level I I would want to be at. Right, but that's it's so critical. I I will um I will jump into email, and the first thing Dan Martell says is, "Don't jump into email. <laughs> yeah, don't touch it until they touch it first, mm. and only touch it if they say, hey, I didn't know the answer to that.'" Right? That's, That's right. probably for you to, to handle. Then you whittle it down even further and go, that person's asking a bigger decision than my pay grade. That's for you. That's mm -hmm. not for me. Right. Yes. And I'll find myself like, uh, okay, I'm not going to type that out. 
Let me see how they handle that. And that's really, really hard. Um, now, I think what prepped me for that is being a father. Uh, mm. My kids would probably argue differently. Uh, my <laughs> wife would probably argue differently. But being a father, I've got uh, my kids, <laughs> for whatever reason, they're just wonderful, wonderful people. I don't think it's because of me. Um, I think I could have been better as a father, more patient, more loving, more kind. I have a pretty high flashpoint. Um, and so anyways, my, my two sons have played really high level competitive soccer and mm -hmm. I'm the first to be like, I don't do that. And then I had to learn, you got to let them learn. Yeah. Um, and so to your point, you, the only way you can scale as a company so far in my experience is by letting other people take, uh, the, the, the piece that you've hired them to do and be excellent at it. And then yes. just let them be excellent at it. So, so well said. Sorry. Josh, this is, this is a conversation I could continue for another hour. I think you, you have so many insights and so much wisdom that you've gleaned so far in your journey. Oh, thank you. If people typically walk away from an episode like this with one big idea, if you could define what you want people to walk away with, what would that one big idea be? Man, that's a heavy question. I hate that it's going to sound salesy, but don't don't risk your business on convenience. That's what I want mm. people to understand. That's good. Um, Stripe is convenient. PayPal is convenient. Square is convenient. They made it that way for a reason. Mm -hmm. It's not really about you, though. Um, and again, I'm not a hater on any of those products. Clearly, those products are wonderful products and serve a fantastic group of people. But for the group of people that you and I talk to, that convenience will bite you. And that's a risk that's unnecessary. And I, I hear people all the time, oh, I've years and years and years, I've never had a problem. Yep, I've had that conversation with enough people to know that it doesn't matter how many years you've never had a problem. Why risk it? Why? why? I, I don't, I, like, I'll say it this way. There, there, there's an old story out there, uh, and I don't want to take too much time. I know we're at the end here, but there's an old story out there about um, somebody who was interviewing truck drivers. And the route for the truck driver was on a mountain road. And that mountain road was pretty wide or pretty narrow. Sorry. And the person interviewing the truck drivers asked the question, how close to the edge of the road do you think you could get your truck with your skill without going over the edge? And the first driver was like, you know what? I could probably get the edge of my tire right on the edge of that road and still deliver that payload in that truck. And then the and the interviewer is like, okay, you know, thanks. And then the second truck driver, you know, I could probably hang that tire probably just a little bit over the edge of that road and still deliver that. And the third driver said, I'm not going to get anywhere near the edge of that freaking road because why would I take the risk to lose the whole load? And so that's what I would have people understand. Again, I'm not a hater on them but it's risky keeping your business there when they've clearly defined that they will cut people off without notice. So why do it? You know, that, that lines so much with what one of my mentors has taught me. John Maxwell says often that leaders see more than other people see and they see before other people see. Yeah. And I believe what you are doing is providing a solution and an on-ramp to that solution for people before they need it, before they're hanging off the side, before they lose the load. And that's, that's why goal. I wanted to be proactive and step yeah. toward this, you know, before I ever had a problem. Yeah, you know, you're such a good example because the conversation that we have, right, I, I think I mentioned to you, like, you're probably in an okay spot, you know, I don't. Mm -hmm if you've not had a problem, I, and I tell that to people like, look, you're probably in an okay spot. I'm not going to drive fear into you. I'm just driving facts. Yes. If facts are hard, facts are hard. I mean, it's just the way that it goes. Right. So, um, yeah, it's, you were proactive. I would love to have more of those conversations with people so they don't ever run into it. So here's the thing. 
if you are proactive and you come to me and I make it seamless for you to move, then you're not under the stress of moving. You can take a little bit of time. You can ask a few more questions. You're not rushed, right? Those that come to me rushed, they tend to have more challenges. It's the nature of it, right? Mm -hmm. But if you come to me unrushed and we get you in and we start saving you money, right? A yes. Crazy sum of money. I, I, my term is usually a dumb sum of money. Um, but if we start saving you money and you can keep Stripe as a backup, if anything ever were to happen, they're yes. free. I'm way less cost. I mean, they're free to keep in the back end, right? They're not free. Yeah. I'm actually getting more and more expensive. Um, but if you could do that, right? Aren't you setting yourself up for more success? It's, it's a real challenge because we live um, in the world of high level, in the world of SaaS, we live in a world of automation. We live in a world of, I should be able to hit a button and get it all done really quickly. And that's always struck me as a strange thing. Like yeah. no, nobody at high level from Sean on down, right? Sean, Robin, Varun, nobody on down says, oh no, it should be two seconds. They say, we built tools for you to make things a bit easier. You still have to build them. You still That's have to right. take the time to build an automation, to build an email campaign, to build an IVR follow-up, right? You still have to take the time to do it, but nobody's taking the time to think through the risk of not having money come through the door. It just, that's why I say, don't risk the convenience. So we talked 10 more minutes well after said. you asked me that question. Sorry. Well said. No, but, but I think that's incredibly helpful. Uh, Josh, I know people are going to want to stay connected to you and continue to learn more about you and about numeric. What is the best way for them to do that? Yeah. Hit us up on our website, numeric.com. Um, I'm connected to Facebook messenger as well. So if you shoot me a message, I'll absolutely respond. Um, well, my, my test will. to that. My assistant will respond now. <laughs> Excellent. Well done. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm still involved day to day in those responses and how things go. So um, that's a good way to stay connected to me. If you land on our website within five minutes of viewing this, please don't judge it. She's not the prettiest girl at the dance. Sorry. But she does. You know, it's so true. Like back in the day, I followed um, Russell Brunson. He is just a good marketer, right? From from yeah. ClickFunnels. He's a good marketer. Oh, yeah. there's, there's no denying that. Um, you know, he, pe people would say like, it doesn't like, if you've got a good product and a good offer, people will buy it. It doesn't matter how pretty your website is. I think I'm a testament yeah. to that because I like my, our website works, but it's not the prettiest, yeah. it's not the prettiest website out there. So, well, that's, uh, that's not why I switched to numeric. Your website. <laughs> <laughs> that's good enough. That's good enough. It's the service. It's the it's the product. So, uh, Josh, thank you for your time and your generosity today in, in oh, sharing you. what you're doing and how people can improve what they are doing and the service they are providing. I think that's always always a win for everybody involved. So, thank you for this. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for thanks for letting me uh, have the time to talk with you. Thanks for joining me for this episode today. As we wrap up, I'd love for you to do two things. First, subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss an episode. And if you find value here, I'd love it if you would rate it and review it. That really does make a difference in helping other people to discover this podcast. Second, if you don't have a copy of my newest book, Catalytic Leadership, I'd love to put a copy in your hands. If you go to catalyticleadershipbook.com, you can get a copy for free. Just pay the shipping so I can get it to you and we'll get one right out. My goal is to put this into the hands of as many leaders as possible. This book captures principles that I've learned in 20 plus years of coaching leaders in the entrepreneurial space, in business, government, nonprofits, education, and the local church. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn to keep up with what I'm currently learning and thinking about. And if you're ready to take a next step with a coach to help you intentionally grow and thrive as a leader, I'd be honored to help you. Just go to catalyticleadership.net to book a call with me. Stay tuned for our next episode next week. Until then, as always, leaders, choose to be catalytic. Thanks for listening to Catalytic Leadership with Dr. William Attaway. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss the next episode. Want more? 
go to catalyticleadership.net.